the last few years, <laughs> the subject of remote viewing has become a buzzword in the circles such as we have here today. One of the premier teachers in this area is David Morehouse, our next speaker, who has been teaching this all over the world since he left the military and teaching it to other people. If this subject is of interest to you, this is the man to listen to as to who does and who does not present the proper information as regard to remote viewing. There's an awful lot of things go on about it in the world that or in the country that you might be a little bit or want to be a little bit wary of. So, without anything further from me, I'm asking that you give a real welcome to David Morehouse, who is with us uh, for the second time here and who teaches this all over the world. Thank you. And you are. Thank you. You're wired for sound. I'm wired. We're gonna. I want you to for sound, let me too. know about. The sound as to how, you, if you can hear him all right. I know his voice will project better. Okay, David. Hi. I've been giving a lot of thought about uh, what I might talk about today and how I might talk about it. Uh, the last two years have been uh, very busy and I'm very tired. And uh, two years time since we started training this this phenomena of remote viewing, this ability, this learned ability to transcend time and space, to view persons, places, or things remote in time and space, and to gather and report intelligence information on the same. We've been teaching uh, in Paris. We taught in Brussels this year. We taught uh, in Oslo, Norway, Örebro, Sweden, Örnsköldsvik, Sweden, Stockholm, Sweden, uh, Göteborg, Sweden, uh, we're teaching in Australia this year in three different cities. We've been uh, to Heidelberg, Germany. We're going to uh, Malaga, Spain. Uh, we've taught back and forth across the United States uh, and have a class planned for Mexico City and several classes in, ha in Hawaii as well. And uh, when we first started doing this, we trained about, we trained police officers when I first came out of the Army. Uh, several police officers and I and an ex advertising executive from Nabisco got together and formed remote viewing technologies and we started teaching police officers pro bono. And we try trained about 386 of them and then started getting offers from England to come and train in England. And of course we didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do it as the principal trainer because I just didn't think that civilians had it in them to be interested in following the dogma and the military protocols of learning to do this thing called remote viewing, coordinate remote viewing. But this individual persisted and then ultimately we said, okay, you build it and we will come. And he did and we, we did come and ta we taught it to 35 individuals in England. And that was just a little over two years ago. We now just finished a class in Hope Springs, South Carolina, which took us in two years time to 5,278 people. Now in 5,278 people, there have been two failures. One was a US Navy SEAL in Santa Cruz, California who uh, came to me at the end of the first day and said, this is not for me. And I said, I understand, I used to be just like you. Uh, and so he left. And then we had another individual in uh, Jotaburg, Sweden, who's an engineering student. Although we have many successful students that are engineers and scientists and doctors uh, that, that work with us throughout the country, throughout the world, uh, this young man has after, despite repeated attempts and going through the class, not been able to accomplish and work his way through coordinate remote viewing. But I think that in part it's because he likes the attention he gets with the failure. You know, all the girls in class and everybody else comes over and puts their hands on him, on his shoulders in time, you know. It'll be all right, you'll, get, you'll learn how to do this and people weep for him and he likes that, you know. So one day soon, he'll cross that bridge and decide he wants to join the legions of the status quo like the rest of us and just be average, right? So, <clears throat> I'm really tired of talking about me, I'm really tired. And uh, what I thought I might do today is kind of put this back in your lap, rather than you sit out there and do the drinking bird routine with your head going up and down while I talk. I thought what I'd do is open this forum up and allow you to ask questions and I'll try to address them. Now, I'll tell you this, 
Uh, I was a third generation Army officer. And I got involved in this because in the deserts of Jordan in 1987, I was wounded in the head by a machine gun bullet. And as a result of that head wound, I had a vision, if you will. And as a result of articulating and sharing that vision with an Army psychologist, I was recruited into this organization where I lived there for two and a half years and worked as a psychic spy for the United States government. And when I decided uh, my psycho spiritual transformation was taking place and that it was time to talk about this and to bring this out to the people of the world, then I was court-martialed, ultimately for dereliction of duty, wrongful disclosure of classified information. I resigned in lieu of that court-martial. I was given an other than honorable discharge. My security clearance was naturally revoked. Uh, I draw no pension from the government. I don't even have a right to be buried in a military cemetery. So if you ask me a question, I will give you the truth about the question as I understand it. I'll wrap no lies around it, okay? And I firmly believe in the reverence of truth rather than just the eagerness of truth. And that is one of my big criticisms about, uh, about those of us that are truth seekers in these kinds of forums. And that's a whole different part of the lecture. So let's see, questions? Yes, there's a microphone over there, and I think they'd like to either pass it around or have you go there. One so thing I forgot, David. Go do it. Dave, yes. one, one thing I forgot to tell people, if they have questions, come up to this mic so everybody can hear the questions. So if you have a question, please line up here at this mic so everybody can get in on it and David can hear you and won't have to repeat the question. Better you participate, okay, than just listen. Hi. Hi. I, other than a machine gun bullet to the head, what do you feel is the best preparation for an adult? Uh, That's a good question. Prior to this training. Uh, first thing is that you can, you can trigger this kind of uh, an ability through an emotional trauma, a uh, physical trauma, a spiritual trauma. And you can run the listing of what those might be for you. Uh, mine was obviously a, a physical trauma followed by a spiritual trauma. Uh, because certain things that I held sacred, I found out were not so sacred for me. Those that, what, what you have to understand is that this is an innate ability in each of us. It's not unique to me, it's not unique to anyone else coming out of that community at all, despite what they might say. All of you have the ability. You may choose to exercise it or you may choose not to exercise it, but it is there for you. What you must learn to do is to control the opening of the aperture and that is what the protocols do. You know, back in circa 1974, when uh, it was uh, Stan Spiel Turner, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency at that time, was told by various human intelligence sources that the Czechs, the Chinese, the Soviets, the Germans, the Israelis, the British, all were heavily involved in the study of the paranormal. And they're looking at various aspects of the paranormal and trying to determine if there were any intelligence collection capabilities out of those things. Uh, the Germans brought theirs out of the Nazi Occult Bureau. That's where the Russians basically brought theirs out of the first ones Nuremberg, and they're the first ones to grab much of the records from the Nazi Occult Bureau. Uh, the British brought most of theirs out uh, as a carryover from what they were doing in their work to counter the Nazi Occult Bureau during the war. Uh, and all of this stuff was being developed. We're looking at it, trying to explore it. Was it going to work? Could it work? And at that point, at that juncture is when Mansfield Turner said, heck, if this works, you know, and if it's only 6% accurate, if it's 6% information that I can glean by through this process that I could not glean by any other means, well then it's intelligence dollars well spent. So let's explore this and find out whether or not it works. And so what he did was, they went to, Stan to Stanford Research Institute International, they took two laser physicists, Russell Targ and Harold Putoff, which in my opinion, if you're looking for the er early on heroes in this, Targ and Putoff would be that. Not the natural psychics, the Ingo Swans, the Pat Prices, and all of the others, because they just brought their talents to the table for pay and did what they do, while it was analyzed by the laser physicists. But these laser physicists, hard scientists, put their reputations on the line to answer the questions. They didn't get paid any more money by saying, yes, it works, than they would have had they turned around and said, no, it doesn't work. But their charge was to determine, was there any credibility to this? Was there any validity to it? Could they train, could they identify the psychological profile on individuals and, indi and identify what was a propensity for it that would make someone good at this? Uh, could they design these protocols? Could they carry these protocols as templates into the regular military and empl employ them there? So that could they just grab 
other people that were not considered to be naturals and now train them in these protocols, open conduits into the unconscious, allow them to open targets, or open aperture into the target and be able to see something distant in time and space and come back with a fairly accurate picture of it. And, the an and then the final question to them was, can you tell us how it works? And the answer to everything was yes. Yes, it does have an application. Yes, we can train it. Yes, we know that it does have some validity. It's not 100% accurate, but it has some validity. And it went all the way up to the final question, which was, can you tell us how it works? Which was the answer was no, which is where all the skeptics want to jump on and, and say, aha, if you can't tell us how it works, then obviously there is no, there's nothing to it at all. These are the same people who go read the skeptical inquirer uh, by the light that they went and flipped the switch on the light, right, and, and illuminated the light switch, but I mean the light bulb, when no physicist in the world can explain how electricity travels down a wire. So when I see one of these skeptical inquirer readers that are reading by candlelight, uh, because that they know is physics, right, then I'll accept that. So it was brought in in that way and it was employed in that manner, and uh, that's where it ended up. That's where they, we just have now gone to just continuously, uh, continually evolutionizing this thing, revolutionizing it, changing it, modifying it, be turned it into this hybrid protocol now that we are teaching across the world, okay? So what can you do to develop that ability? Just be you. Let go of what you think you already know to be true. Walk into a class, choose carefully who will teach you, you know, understand you're going to be fragmented and reconstructed under a new way of knowing, not believing. You know, believing's easy, knowing is hard. You must go through the protocols and learn them and practice them and you will be able to do this just like anyone else. And there really isn't anything else that you can take, particularly in coordinate remote viewing, that's gonna improve anything for you. Let go of the outcome. Let go of what you think you already know to be true and learn it in purity. Okay? Yes. Some people believe this country is rapidly deteriorating into a police state, and the police are gaining more and more powers constantly. Why would you be interested in enhancing their techniques and their tools? Why would, we have, why would I have taught police officers? Is that the question? Why would you be interested in helping police expand their powers and their tools for oppressing the American people? Well, that kind of goes into the category of defining your own personal mythology in my book. You know, uh, the question is often asked to me, what makes you want to take this thing out and aren't you afraid of who you're teaching this to and aren't you afraid that it's gonna fall into the wrong hands, a la police officers and others? And my, my response to that is, it was already in the wrong hands. It was in the wrong hands when it belonged to the Central Intelligence Agency and was sequestered away as a weapon of war and as an intelligence collection asset. The fact that it's brought out now and given to the rest of the world does not make it a dangerous thing. It makes it a good thing. It empowers humanity, okay? but I cannot guarantee how indi each individual will use it, nor would I ever try to. That's individual free agency. That's defining your own personal mythology. If there are police officers that choose to use it for, for good or bad, then that's their choice. There will always be more good, and good will win. Truth will win over the other. If, that, if you must know that, if you don't know that, why are you here? Okay? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned how it would you mentioned that it would fragment you, and I would like for you to comment on that. Right, so I'm saying it fragments your belief structures. Mm -hmm. There are always people who will come into class with some preconceived notion, okay? It's like the first rule in learning to be good at this is forget what you think you already know. And so people will come into it, uh, naturals and all kinds of other people will come in and ha already have an understanding, they believe, of what it is and what they're capable of doing with it. And those are the people who invariably do the worst, okay? Then, and so what I'm saying to you is, uh, you're going to be fragmented in your belief structures, your understandings, and then you're going to be reconstructed. And that's not to say that I'm asking you to give up your existing belief structures because I believe in all paths uh, crossed and through the terrestrial plane and into the infinite holographic universe or the matrix of all creation. I understand that to be true. So what I ask you to do though in learning this, if you come to one of my classes, is understand that I'm not going to accept your belief structures at that moment. I'm going to crush them down and I want you to just leave them at the door. Let us, allow us to reconstruct you in a new way of understanding, a new way of knowing, and then you decide how you will take your belief structure and either reinforce what you have now learned or take what you have now learned to reinforce your own existing belief structures, okay? Yes, sir. Are your protocols any different and is your instructional methodology any different than that of Ed Dames? Uh, I don't know. You haven't had the opportunity to view his tapes? 
Uh, Ed Dames wasn't a remote viewer. Ed Dames was a monitor. He was not a remote viewer. So I don't know what Ed Dames teaches for protocols. Can you share with us some of the things that the uh, CIA wanted you to do or some of the kinds of things that they wanted you to do with this? Sure. Uh, there were always training targets. Uh, there were training targets were divided into two different categories. There were training and operational targets. Training targets were used to calibrate remote viewers. Me training targets and the beauty of, understand this as the beauty of remote viewing, is that remote viewing gives you quantifiable, measurable attributes relating to a particular target, which gives you undeniable, irrefutable evidence that you were present in this particular target, remote in time and space, and brought back data from that target. And what they do with this training data, or the training targets, because they have known quantifiable attributes, and we do the same thing in the company, is we now measure the remote viewer and give the, assign to them a numerical score based on the amount of, of pure data they brought back from the target, because it's not 100% accurate. Never has been, never will be. And you never trust the results of a single remote viewer operating independently of other remote viewers. You must use a group effort, not all of them working together at the same time. Nobody sharing data, but it's all part of the model, which is something that's very complex and much more difficult to describe in 55 minutes than you would even imagine. And uh, because it's not a standalone endeavor is the final rule, that remote viewing must always be employed in consonance with other research methodologies, investigative methodologies, if you're talking about police forces, uh, research and development methodologies if you're talking about employing it in science and other areas. And that's what we do with it, the employed in, the, in that, uh, that model, that analytical model. Now, that's what training targets are, and that calibrates remote viewers. That allows us to know that this young lady up here, on any given day, she may start out at 36%. Two days from now, she may jump up to 42%. She may drop down to 22% or 7%, and she will cycle up and cycle back down. But it is employing her against, known, against targets that have known quantifiable attributes to us playing in the analytical role that allow us to calibrate her. Then you can be employed when you cross that magical number of 60%, then you're employed against operational targets. And operational targets run the spectrum. They ran the spectrum from looking at everything to trying to determine whether or not there was an intercontinental ballistic missile in a particular so, uh, silo of a particular missile blossom, or right on down to looking and trying to track down a suspected double agent within the Central Intelligence Agency, for, to drug shipments, to looking at the uh, targets in the war, uh, the war on drugs, to looking at the targets in the Gulf War, and so forth and so on. So operational targets were not something that we were ever able to to really filter for ourselves because we worked under the Directorate of Technologies and Science, uh, DT-S, of the Defense Intelligence Agency with oversight provided by the Central Intelligence Agency. And the, the taskings came through the DIA, down through DT-S, to us. And if they were operational targets, we never knew what they were. The only time we got an inkling that some of these targets might not be legitimate targets or the kinds of targets that we should have been working was uh, there was a general by the name of Harry Soyster. Anybody heard of him? Soyster became the commander of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Soyster was a born-again Christian, which may have had something to do with this, because there were a number of factions within the military intelligence community and outside of it that considered this to be of the devil and dark work and those kinds of things. It wasn't a legitimate science, and it was occult in nature, and they wanted it destroyed. They wanted it crushed. There were actually, when it was in the Pentagon, in the basement of the Pentagon, there was an 06 holding prayer vigils trying to find this thing and remove it from his army, you know? that kind of stuff going on. So Ho Harry Soyster, when he was at the Intelligence Security Command, knew that this thing had been moved, and it had been moved. Uh, they tried to kill it there when they took it out of INSCOM, but there were a number of congressmen that were read onto the program, and so they sponsored its new home, which was DT-S, uh, under the direct oversight of Dr. Jack Verona, who was the chief scientist of DIA, the ranking scientist at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Lo and behold, about four years later, Soyster became the commander of the DIA, put on his second star and came there as the commander. And when he came there, he immediately turned and, and ordered an, an inspector general investigation of the unit. And so this is where we started to get wind that maybe everything we were involved in was not copacetic because they started a massive shredding campaign where they went in it and they were working well into the night shredding documents out of the safes. And the only thing that would say to you is that if there was an inspector general coming to the unit to look at the unit's work and to look at what the unit was producing, then they were trying to remove things that might have been construed as illegal, uh, misleading or perpetrated, you know, things that were being perpetrated against the people of the United States or others. 
that were illegal in nature. So they were trying to purge those from the document base of the organization. And from there, uh, your guess is as good as mine. We worked on all kinds of things. Yes, sir. I understand there are different kinds of remote viewing, and I understand there are different kinds of remote viewing, and I was wondering if you would describe them as you use them uh, in the military and um, how you would deploy them operationally, what choices you would make. There are two kinds of remote viewing that I was trained in. One was coordinate remote viewing, which is moving through the process of taking a coordinate, going into an altered state of consciousness. You take, go into an altered state of consciousness, which in this particular case is an alpha wave state. Because you're working in the matrix of the unconscious and the matrix of the conscious, you're doing a dance. It is called the two kinesthetic activities of coordinate remote viewing are detecting and decoding. Detecting is in the unconscious matrix, decoding is in the conscious matrix. And so you move back and forth, porpoising up and down in alpha and up to beta again and back down into alpha. And you go through this process of declaring advanced visuals, of personal inclemencies, going to a queuing position, taking a series of coordinates. The coordinates become, now I'm just going to say this, but you won't understand it. Uh, don't try to think too hard about it. It'll hurt your head. Most people can't figure it out. If you ever do figure out what the nature of the coordinate process is, run to Stanford and tell them you figured it out and they'll pay you for your answer, okay? And that is that the coordinates are random numbers, random numbers representative of the concept of the target and the matrix of the collective unconscious. And that is all that they are. They are simply an address to that particular data bit, which is that target and the matrix of all creation. And so when you take the coordinates, immediately following the coordinates, uh, which are now two sets of four digits, uh, that you respond autonomically with what is called an ideogram. The ideogram is the first graphic representation of the target site. It can, in some cases, be a very rough, loose contour drawing of the, of, the, of the particular site. Then you go through an A, B, C component decoding process. The A component is just retracing the ideogram, describing the motion of the ideogram, up, down, angle, across, peaking, so forth and so on. The B component of the ideogram is determining whether it's natural or man-made. The C component is determining whether it's structure, life form, land, water, land, water, interface, or mountain, okay? And then you move into stage twos, where you capture colors, textures, smells, sounds, temperatures, tastes, Okay, dimensionals, horizontals, verticals, arches, mass and density, energetics. You sketching to the left, simple contour drawings again. Then you're writing to the right, descriptions of those things, all kinds of conscious mind. AOL begins to percolate in, and you're taught how to work in the, in the structure of dealing with all of that. And you move from there into stage threes, where you develop these contour sketches, and you begin to label them and probe them, and do more work in them, and then you move into stage four. When you go into stage four, you're now about page 15 to 20. When you go into stage four, you work in what is called a stage four matrix, and I'm talking really fast, I know that, but you're working from left to right. You're working in stage twos, but we've now bifurcated dimensionals outside of stage twos, so they're a separate category because we want to prompt that verbal sensory data. And you're also moving into aesthetic impacts, emotional impacts, tangibles, intangibles, AOL, which is the process of your imagination, and AOL signal, which is the process of your imagination overlaid with raw data. You move from there into stage five. Stage five takes an intangible concept, which is now taking that one intangible concept word and breaking it out into about 35 to 45 more words, each one containing usable data reference pertaining to that particular target. And that is by taking those things and calling on now data that is brought forth, evoked out of the brain, not the mind. So it's disengaging from the signal line. Is any of this making sense? Disengaging from the signal line and moving through attributes of objects, or rather moving through emanations derived from objects, attributes, subjects, and topics. And then you move into stage six, which is where you start working off of two sheets of paper at the same time. One is capturing verbal sensory data in the stage six matrix, which is exactly like the stage four matrix. And you're now developing your drawings no, no longer into simple contour sketches or dimensional sketches, but now into detailed drawings of the target site, which are called renderings. And then you prepare a summary which laces all of that information together, maybe 25, 35, 45 pages, dependent upon the viewer. And that data is then piled into for the analysis along with the results of maybe 20 or 30 other viewers. And that is coordinate remote viewing. Extended remote viewing is devoid of the structure of coordinate remote viewing. It works with a whole new lexicon. It now takes you into ultra deep, somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, three to five hertz or cycles per second of brainwave activity. Of course, it can't, you never stay there, so you drop off asleep, start snoring and drooling, and then you come back up again and you brought porpoise back up and down again. But the great thing about extended remote viewing is the length of time in the target site, which is about two hours. It takes 45 minutes in the cool down process, and then you're released through a new launch mechanism into the target where you then begin to perceive the target 
uh, in real time and space in real time, transcending time and space, and come back with usable data again. Only your data is two hours long now instead of maybe an hour long that you would get out of coordinate remote viewing. And that's the two different kinds that we teach. Yes? Before I ask my main question, could you explain what the acronym AOL frequency Anal stands for? AOL is analytical overlay. It's the process of conscious overlay of the data. The data percolating up out of the unconscious, because we're establishing conduits into the unconscious, the data percolating up out of the unconscious is pure data. It's like Robert Irving, Irving, Irwin said, the painter, that really, when you only really begin to see when you forget the name of what it is you're looking at. And that's the truth in a coordinate remote viewer. They forget the name of what they're looking at, raw data percolates up. They begin to dis dissect it and they begin to describe it. But conscious mind looks at it and starts to take the data and starts to say, going through the visual record and the verbal record, and it starts to say, I know what this is. So it starts trying to call the target. And it takes, you know, it takes uh, things and says, AOL, a car, analytical overlay, a car. When you're taught as a remote viewer to completely reverse the process, it's not a car, it's some screeching, whirring, sputtering, purring, hum, you know, thundering, fumy smell, uh, you know, different describing the textures and the dimensionals and the temperatures and the sounds of this kind of, of this particular object. It's not a car, it's dissecting it down. Now, analytical overlay signal is having the raw data percolate up and having the, con the conscious mind take the raw percolated data, understand what it is, but then overlay bad data on top of it, but it still is translucent, it's transparent, and you can see it. You can see kind of beyond it, so you, but you don't know really what is right and what is wrong, or what's usable or non-usable. So you must rely upon the structure to just regurgitate that on the page and continue moving forward. The only people that are allowed to be analytical about the session are the individuals that are playing program managers or an, in an analytical role, but not the remote viewer. So you cannot analyze your own session, okay? Could you explain what your current understanding is now, both at an intuitive and an experiential level of how the human mind can access information at a distance from simple coordinates. Now, because that's how you're asking me to go into the philosophy and the theory behind the coordinates, and that again, that's a two hour lecture just talking about that, uh, complete with slides. And we don't really ever understand it, and I just don't want, I don't want to answer it philosophically. I only want to answer it based on what I know. Well, why does remote viewing work? That again is a philosophical question. And all the data is available from Stanford if you really want to know that. If you really want to know the answer to the, to the question, do the homework, because Stanford has the data. Well, they don't do know how it works, and they don't really know why it works. You know, we said that up front. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't work, does it? But from your intuitive level, from spending so much time, do you have a sense of what the relationship is between the human mind and the world out there? But, yeah, but it's my opinion, and it's, the opinion of, it's my opinion and my students' opinion, uh, based on what we learn, and, and that is that we know that at the unconscious level, we know at the unconscious level, that we are omnipotent, uh, omniscient, all-seeing, all-knowing, omnipresent beings. We are, all of you are. All of you have that ability. Not, again, not unique to me. You are co-creators. That makes you, or gives you all of the qualities normally assigned to deities, does it not? And that's where people really start to get rubbed the wrong way, because you start saying to people, well, look, you know, here's a scientific proof, and it happens all the time. Just had 78 students in South Carolina. You know, and in, after a day and a half of training, they work a 40-minute target, and they come back, and we go through the collective effort and the analysis of the target data, and the sketches are there, and the verbal sensory data is there, and you have 78 people, do you see this spark go off behind their eyes that says, I just went distant in time and space and saw something and brought back usable data from that particular target. I may not have done it exactly like I wanted to do it, because we want to see what we think is perfect sight, which is physical sight, and we're learning to see with non-physical eyes, which is a whole different process. But it begins what's called a psycho-spiritual transformation in people when that begins to happen. When you know that you are omnipotent, omniscient, all-seeing, all-knowing, omnipresent, that you are timeless, eternal beings at that level. When you know that, then you begin to change your whole perspective on all things. Your whole relationship to the matrix of all creation, your significance and yet insignificance to it, you know, your relationship to your spouse, to your loved ones, your lover, to the rest of humanity, to the planet as a whole. And then it gets, goes beyond that. And when you begin to feel, uh, you begin to feel and realize uh, your relationship to the whole of the matrix, 
Uh, you begin to develop a more deeper and more complete understanding of your relationship to the matrix from an environmental perspective. And I'm not talking about a classic definition of it environmentally. You begin to understand that what you think, say, and do at this level in the terrestrial plane affects what takes place out there in the matrix and vice versa. What applies in the matrix has another application or has another has another uh, uh, chain reaction effect back down here. And as you begin to develop that kind of understanding, then it, it becomes very humbling for you, very humbling, because then you know what truth is. And when you know what truth is, then your life has purpose. And that's what begins to happen in these classes. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is in regards to uh, some of the experimentation, remote viewing, and whether or not you've done this and had some feedback in regards to doing viewing on one of your members in a group, and then that uh, one group member that had that remote viewing done to them, uh, giving you feedback whether or not uh, they uh, saw that remote viewing and which directional is looking at. You're speaking in screen. code to me, all right? You're, you're talking code. Use names and specifics, otherwise I don't understand what you're talking about. Okay, I'm talking about, have you done remote viewing on your own members, your... Students? Students, where a group goes in, say, whatever your group is, 10, and then to squadron off one of them, and for that evening you do a remote viewing on that one, and then the next following day you get a feedback from that one that you were... The that's called beaconing. Right, that, beaconing. That's called beaconing. And okay. do we practice beaconing? No, because the class of phase, the coordinate remote viewing class is divided into two, two phases. Phase one is 35 hours, that's stages one, two, and three. And phase two is 35 hours, that's stages four, five, and six. Phase three is basic, ex basic extended remote viewing, and that's 50 hours because it's five days, 10, day, f 10 hours a day. And phase, phase four, which is they're called the master extended remote viewing class, which is by invitation only, is another 50 hours. So we, we are chock full of objectives, training objectives and goals that we work through on that and doing things like dowsing and timelines and working on beaconing exercises and those kinds of things are not anything that we packed into the training program yet. Okay, and uh, last question in regards to um, uh, there's power in numbers. Did you find a specific number where it increases the ability for remote viewing as a body? No, we didn't, but more is always better. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a synergy that begins to happen. You know, there's this, this, there's this wonderful relationship, this energy vortex that begins to occur you know, in a large group. And when you know, my classes are large, they're large. You know, they ended up being, Probably the smaller classes that we have nowadays are 45 students, and most of them run 70 and above, and some in Sweden over 100. And so the bigger the class, the more, dy you know, the, the dynamic just spins at an, it resonates at a different, you know, at a different frequency, and people learn faster in larger groups than they do in smaller groups, and that's for a number of reasons. One, just because of the resonance taking place there, the morphic resonance taking place, and two, because of, uh, larger classes have a tendency to knock down, you know, personalities. Smaller class now, classes, personalities start percolating up and people start trying to make their own agendas and develop their own platforms, which is not a good thing. Okay, and uh, you said alpha wave, one last thing. Dr. Johns has been experimenting with uh, going beyond alpha into zeta and balancing the, the mind on both left and right. Uh, have you done any uh, are you talking about hemisphere, hemispherical synchronization? Right. Just like the Monroe tapes are doing, hemisync tapes? Well, Using artificial tones to induce an artificial theta wave state by balancing both right and left hemisphere of the brain. Other than that, I don't know anything about it, and we don't do anything like that. The, the cool down CDs that we've developed, we scripted and practiced and worked with and used brainwave trainers on uh, students until we got the scripting and the timing and the verbiage right. And uh, we don't do anything to, I, I'm not even familiar with that wavelength or, or cycles per second that you just mentioned. But I'm only familiar with beta and alpha and theta and ultra deep, which is really a hypnotherapy term, ultra right. deep, and then delta. And those are the ones I'm familiar with. Anything else, where did it come from? But that's where you stop everybody from falling off. You, you stop yeah. this and you stay synchronized in that wave pattern and then you get more out of it. Theoretically, that's right. ultra deep, three to five hertz as well. Same thing, trying to keep them right there before they drop over the edge. 
Is the difference between remote viewing and astral projection one of dimension? Yeah, uh, they are not the same at all. Uh, one is a projection of consciousness, and the other theoretically is a separation of the astral body or the spirit body from the physical body. And that does not occur in remote viewing, extended or coordinate. Now, the unit participated in experimentation dealing with uh, astral projection. They were trying to do out-of-body remote viewing. And what they found uh, was this. In fact, I participated in those not too successfully. Uh, they found that they could not invoke uh, an out-of-body separation at will, and then when they did make it happen, or when it did occur, they could not control the astral body. It moved like an untethered balloon in, a win in the wind. Now, I know that there are people that take issue with that and say, oh yes, well I can, and I can do whatever I want to do with it, and I can do it when I want to do it. I'm just telling you, that was not the experiment, I mean, that was not the experience of the unit's experiments, and so they dropped it, and they just stuck with coordinate remote viewing and extended remote viewing. And transmediumship, you know, automatic writing, that kind of stuff. They stuck with that as well. So you're making a distinction between projection of one's consciousness. Are How? they both essentially, I mean, your body doesn't go anywhere when, when Well, I think there's a projection. distinct difference just even, even in theory of it. Uh, just even your basic baseline understanding of a projection of consciousness versus uh, projection of consciousness, we're talking about opening conduits into the unconscious, meaning sta remaining stationary in time and space, yet opening uh, conduits into that unconscious aspect of yourself, which we have already said is that omnipotent, omniscient, all-seeing, all-knowing, omnipresent aspect of yourself, where the other is trying to actually cause a, a separation of the soul body or spirit body or astral body from the physical body, where you turn around, look at the physical body, and people talk about the silver thread and so forth and so on, and moving out and doing that. Now, again, we've experimented at it, but just as I explained it to you right there, there are two distinct differences. Are our current uh, intelligence gathering agencies uh, using a remote viewing or other psychic uh, phenomena Absolutely. for intelligence? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, if Stansfield Turner came back and said, I don't care if it's only 6% accurate, that's intelligence dollars well spent. If it gives me 6% information that I cannot glean by any other means. Now, if you take what he just said there and you admit the fact that it, before the book Psychic Warrior came out, which is the one that I wrote, which got me in so much trouble, before that book came out, uh, two weeks before the book came out, the CIA executed a well-planned media blitz. They bulldozed the building, buildings down, you know, hauled the debris away, planted grass where the buildings were, went on Ted Koppel, Larry King Live, went across all of the major newspapers across the United States, and they said, yes, we did this. Uh, we only did it for 20 years. We only spent $20 million on it. We only deemed it to be 15% accurate. We no longer consider it a viable intelligence collection tool. So we're not going to do it anymore, right? Like you'd believe that, right? See, they think that you believe that the director of the Central Intelligence Agency came to work one day and while he was drinking coffee and eating donuts with the boys, turned around and said, hey, you know that psychic warfare program we've had for the last 24 years? Let's just tell the American people about it today, right? Just understand this and you know this already. You're truth seekers. They are not an information agency. When they talk to you, they are not talking you to keep you informed about what's going on behind their doors. They're telling you something because they want you to look another direction so they can do something over here, or they want you to accept their definition, their version of the story first. And that's what they're hoping you'll go away with. And so that's, are they, are they still doing it? Absolutely. When, when, you know, they never keep all of their eggs in one basket. This was one basket. There were other units. There was a unit in NSA, allegedly. There was a unit in, another unit in DIA. There were other units elsewhere. And that means that just like anything else in the military, particularly in the intelligence community, if someone corrupts that one particular basket, like me, then all they do is fold it in on itself, tell their version of the story about it, tell everybody and re rest assured we're not going to do this anymore, and then the others continue to exercise and, and execute the mission. You know, and they, they make an example of the individual that told the other story, you see, so that they can say, see, this will happen to you if you tell the story. Uh, would you uh, comment on the uh, rumor that uh, uh, the NSA has a, a, a quantum computer? Has a quantum computer? Yeah, you for gathering the fluid based, intelligence. Uh, the fluid-based computer, the, the, the one that qua the spinning uh, omnidirectionally, cognates omnidirectionally? Well, I know that they're working on it. I don't know if they have one in place right now, and, and I really wouldn't know because I worked next to the NSA, but nobody ever took me in the gate and showed me around. 
And uh, so all I can say is I, I heard rumor of it. I know that it's a theoretical possibility. And I would assume that anything that comes out in popular science or popular mechanics is probably about one or two year old technology. And that's just my assumption, which means that it's probably being heavily worked on and may, may in fact be in place. But I don't know. Uh, would you care to comment on any of the uh, more recent interesting uh, targets that you've uh, explored and uh, in the political, economic, or geographic? Uh? I, you know, I would tell you anything that I knew about that, but I don't, we don't do that. In, in RVT, we train people to do this. Uh, we have a group for, an advanced, for advanced students called the Infinity Project, and it's all extended remote viewers. There are about 500 of them now. Uh, and those people that run this for me out of Doylestown, Pennsylvania, they work for whoever comes to them uh, with a legitimate mission, a legitimate purpose. We're working with a women's wellness center in Atlanta. Uh, the medical staff have been remote viewing trained and we work in support of the medical model there. We work with uh, private investigators, we work with law enforcement agencies, but we have very rigid protocols and established procedures before we'll do that. I, as a trainer, focus on training and I don't do any of that other kind of stuff and I don't get involved in it. I don't roll up my sleeves and do any of that kind of work. That's what I train those, ex those advanced remote viewers to do that for. And they understand the model and they understand the protocols and they work in consonance with these law enforcement agencies and research and development agencies uh, to, to try to employ remote viewing as a science as well as an art, uh, you know, the practical application of it working with those other agencies. And, and I don't do any of it at all. Hi. Hi, David. How are you? Good. Um, i am uh, got some questions about some weird things that are going on in this country. That we okay. all do. And maybe you have some people that are maybe are still on the inside, so to speak, that would communicate with you on some of these um, problems. Oh, um, they all hate me. They, they all say, hate you. They all hate me. They don't say anything to me. There isn't a one, huh? No, but ask. Ask well, away. Here's why I'll ask away. Uh, the crazy thing that's going on seemingly in this country only, I don't hear about it in Europe or any, anywhere else, is that um, there are these shootings in workplaces, in schools, and um, I was trying to get at the basic, we know it's not the guns. Um, for a while I thought well, perhaps, perhaps it's the, uh, there is an effect with the Prozacs and the related drugs, and then maybe there might be a, decent, a, a, a deeper reason why um, children are having to line up in schools for Ritalin and having all the ADD problems in the first place. And um, I just wondered if you had somebody that um, I think know that the answer is multidimensional. I don't think that there's a simple answer to it. I, I think, you know, having one of those millennial children myself who has had um, a, a number of suicide attempts and, and done other things like that, I think that the millennial generation is one of our principal focuses. You know, all of us came out as baby boomer, boomers and Gen Xers, and we were really kind of the me generation, and we were really focused in this new age uh, phenomena, which basically failed because it lost interest in itself. And it lost because about six years ago, we went from 2,900 new age institutes down to less than 300 of them that were really active and functioning. Yes, there were some small gatherings, but I'm talking about institutes that were turning a profit, bringing people in, and teaching them about, uh, about these new sciences. Uh, and that meant that we turned a corner and we dropped off and we lost interest. And we lost interest because uh, the new age focus was focused on self taking care of me, improving me, reaching this position of this state of an enlightened being, me, 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 me. That goes against the very fundamental nature of who and what we are. We are not focused on me. We're not me kind of people. It's not the way we are at the unconscious level. At the unconscious level, we're very much focused on others, the rest of humanity. S.L.A. Marshall said in his book, Men Against Fire, where he took and interviewed uh, soldiers coming out of World War II, Korea and Vietnam. Why did you fight? You know, why did you stand in a position and fight knowing that you were risking all that you were all of your life? You know, why did you fight? Was it for God? No. Was it for country and flag, uniform, honor, duty? No, no, none of those, none of those things. Then why was it? Was it out of fear? Well, that played a role, but why did you fight? for this person, this soul standing next to me. That's why I fought. And for the one in the hole next to me there, and the one over here and the one over there, which that's a very simplistic but a very practical application that says to us, our responsibility is to the whole of humanity and not simply to ourselves. And that's why that, it, that died out. So what I'm saying now is the carryover of that is when we look at the Gen, the gen Ms, the millennials, you know, 18 and younger now, 
They seem to have no focus, no purpose. They don't understand what their calling and election, their role is in this life. And because of that, there's a great deal of scattered, fragmented you know, reaction to the environment around them. One of them is the things that you're beginning to see, Con you know, in heightened suicide attempts. Instead of pumping $5 billion into education in California, they're pumping $5 billion in to expand the prison sentence system. Okay, there. I understand okay? that part too, and I understand that we do have that problem. And well, what you're I'm looking to for me to give you some kind of conspiracy theory feedback. No, that not says necessarily. That maybe some population control uh, weapon no, that's working. Not, well, it could be. There's some people that would like to know it from that standpoint. I've heard of um, th that we have so much microwaving just from the cell towers, maybe uh, that sort of thing. Um, I, I kind of thought it would be th that we do have um, a lot more. Um, yes, there is a, this, this uh, like uh, Begich describes, the, the HARP program and, and that. And there is the mind control that we hear about. Whether it's just that some are canaries in the mines that are more reactive, but all I can say is we did not have these suicides before they started giving out all the Prozac in the schools. Okay. Ritalin and, and then Prozac. Yeah. Later. I, I mean, I, I think that that's one more part of the equation, but I wouldn't hang it all on that. I, I, yeah. What I was going to try to get to, and, and I, in a long answer, is to say when I said multidimensional, I meant that it deals with all of those kinds of issues, and the focus is what do we do? What's our mission? What are, we, what are we supposed to do for the millennials to provide them focus and purpose and mission? What do we do? You know, what are we doing to make that happen? Is this the forum that's making that happen? If there are, where are all the 18-year-old below in this gathering here? You know, that's what we need to be reaching out for to change that. Okay, next. Uh, hi, David. Hi. Um, here's a preconceived notion. Uh, it seems to me that once you had achieved mastery of this technique and realized that you were an infinite omniscient being, uh, that you, you would have a natural desire to want to apply that to discover all the secrets of the universe and all of the answers to all of the big questions. Um, Courtney Brown attempted something like that and lost a lot of credibility in the process. Is there something inherently uh, unstable or, or un invalid about, about approaching those bigger questions that can't be verified? <coughs> well, the root of the problem, the answer is no, the answer is no. There's not something inherently unstable about the, pro the procedure. The protocol is stable. The protocol does not lie. You must understand the rules as I articulated them to you. One, it's not 100% accurate. So then when you start standing here and telling people that I'm remote viewing God, Jesus Christ, God, Buddha, Muhammad, and so forth and so on, you pay your nickel, take your chances, okay? So you know it's not 100% accurate. Two, you never trust the results of a single remote viewer operating independently of other remote, of other remote viewers. And three, it's not a standalone protocol. And beyond that, it goes into all of the other unwritten protocols. You never front load remote viewers. When you turn around to remote viewers and say, hail, hail bop object following described, everybody that's in your little gathering is going to turn around and give you plenty of information about what you just front loaded them with. Okay? So that destroys the purity of it. It's no longer pure viewing. It's now front loaded. Uh, you know, construct. People are turning around building, fabricating data. And then if you as the individual that's the teacher or the program manager don't understand the protocols enough to be able to sort out the AOL and the AOL signal and you made the fatal mistake of front loading them in the first place, you'll never have good raw data. So what we're saying is what we have learned is a continually journey. You know, we move beyond a construct, of, uh, a position of believing, of hoping and wishing and wanting that we are all these things and that we have all of these answers that you just mentioned there, and you move from there into a position of knowing, knowledge, based on experience gained in the physical and the non-physical world. And that's what we teach for you to do that, that irrefutable, undeniable evidence that you just did what we said you were going to do. And then when you develop that, then you understand truth. When you understand truth, then you know very clearly that if you want to go to the metaphor of the mountain and talk about all the paths rising to the top, that there never really is any summit. There never really is anything there. It is just one continuous progression on a path towards wisdom. And that's what it's all about out there. And the thing that happens is you move into the matrix and you see the matrix, and if you'll pardon the expression, it's like stepping into the matrix and stepping into darkness is what we say, and you see 150,000 pieces of the puzzle, which is the matrix. Okay, it's, I, I'm just using that as an example to get your mind wrapped around it. And, it. and everybody that comes back, comes back with five pieces of the 150,000 pieces that are out there. When you're standing in the matrix, in the four-dimensional dimension, in the four-dimensional four world of the matrix, or the four-dimensional realm of the matrix, not the fourth dimension, the four-dimensional realm of the matrix, when you see that, the matrix of all creation, from that perspective, it's all made known to you. 
You understand it there. When you bring it back, we lack the lexicon. We lack the words. We cannot describe it. So we bring back understandings of 5, 10, 15, 120 pieces. And then we become the new star metaphysician, the new philosopher, the new book writer, you know, the new person that's got the great new understanding of the matrix, the meaning of life and the meaning of all things out there, life after life after life. And that's what we know. And the great fun thing about extended remote viewing is that, where, that is where that journey is made. And that's where that wisdom comes back. And it's really a lot of fun to set in a class of 52, 75 extended remote viewing students, all who went and looked at targets like that and saw things out there in the matrix that were specific targets for them to look at and came back and to watch them try to articulate what it was they understood and experienced while they were out there. From what I understand of the process, isn't it possible uh, if one wanted to explore uh, specifics of the larger picture to, uh, to enlist uh, independent third parties to compile lists of targets that would, you would not have any awareness of that could then, uh, in a way that would not be known to you, eventually be fed back into yeah. your group as... That's the model that we talk about. When we talk about the application model, the practical application model, you have whatever the target happens to be. If you look at the medical model, it's a patient, maybe a woman dying of a degenerative disease. That, that model actually gets represented. Am I time, is my time up? OK. Uh, gets represented as a puzzle for the illustration purposes. When you look at the puzzle, the puzzle has known, known you know, attributes to it. We have certain aspects of the puzzle we understand. We know, based on patient history and those kinds of things, we fill in certain pieces. Yet there are still pieces that are missing. Those pieces then have to be expressed as questions, targeting questions. But the people that take care of that part of the analysis in the model is the medical team, made up of the doctors who are trained as remote viewers, other members of the medical staff who are trained as remote viewers. They look at that puzzle, they establish the questions, they assign as program managers, wearing that hat now, program manager, they assign the coordinates to it. Random numbers representative of the concept of the target and the matrix of the collective unconscious. They then send those over to the remote viewing team which looks at that in the blind, working only on the coordinates, and they produce data. Each of the remote viewers produce data. The data is then taken by the medical team in the analytical role. They take the data and they divide it into usable and non-usable data, not good or bad, not right or wrong, usable or non-usable. It's then applied in consonance with all of the other research methodologies, all of the other assets available, $35 billion medical database, R&D, trial and error, pharmaceuticals, the experience of the, of the medical staff, the patient history, intuition, nutritional issues, on and on and on. And all of that's bounced and carried and mixed with the remote viewing data, and it's all applied to the puzzle again, to the model. And they start filling in pieces, reinforcing other pieces, reestablishing new questions. And the bottom line you must learn from what I just threw at you there is that remote viewing, if applied accurately and precisely, appropriately in the practical model, it must be understood that it is a process, not an event. It's never a one snapshot look by remote viewers and taken and thrown back on the wall to say, this solved the problem, because it does not. It's a very elaborate process. And one question is now segmented into 10 questions. You know, and it just keeps getting more and more convoluted. But the doctors working with us in support of that across the, across the globe love it because they know that it doesn't detract from anything else. It only augments what, el what else is there. So the model works if you live within the model and articulate the model. And kind live of an within infinitely the unfolding process. I'm an sorry? An infinitely unfolding process. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Yes, Mark. Dave, are you going to do a three-hour workshop? And did you bring any of the uh, sketches from any of the target sessions of classes? And no, I'm not going to do a three-hour workshop. No. You may talk me into it, but I wasn't going to do that because I was going to head for, I have to go back to Sweden. It's just, I live in Sweden six months out of the year now. And uh, there's a lot happening in Europe with us. And so I'm there six or seven months out of the year, and I live in Jotaberg, Sweden. And then I spend the rest of the time on the west coast of California, which is where I live when I'm in the US. So I wasn't planning on doing a workshop. Um, we've got to get going again. OK. Are any group of people better? Students, in your experience, men, women, younger, older? That's a really interesting question. Uh, the classes have such a broad mix, you know, 
that there doesn't seem to be any kind of category that, you know, that, that sticks out. Uh, it depends, you know, younger people have difficulty with the vocabulary and the established lexicon and the new physics of it. They have, you know, anyone that 13 or younger, unless they're partic particularly bright. Uh, but we've trained 11, 12, 13 year old kids in Scandinavia, uh, but they're, they do better at it than American children do. Uh, older folks, you know, say 65 and older, they're open to it, but there again, it's the new physics, the new science that starts to outrun them and their understanding of that. So, the, the, you know, the Gen Xers and the baby boomers do very well, and the millennials have yet to grasp it, and those that are past that and on the other end of the spectrum probably have a little bit more difficult time with it. But they, they still do it. They just don't do it as well as they'd like to. Does your, uh, uh, your information indicate what the government is doing now in the way of spending money on this and training people, or do you have anybody uh, that tells you anything like that? No, but I, I mean, I, my, my sense of it is this, and I don't have it on any hard evidence other than to say, it's a passive intelligence collection methodology. It's a passive thing. Now, because it's passive does not mean that it can't be turned into something active. And they were working on the protocols early on uh, in my retirement to, to use this as what they called remote influencing. But don't, you know, just understand that if they thought that they had the ability to move distant in time and space and passively gather information about something and turn around and use it to their benefit, don't you think that the CIA, if they thought there was even a remote, pardon the pun, possibility that they could use the power of a human mind to influence another human being, that they would not work on very, very diligently on trying to develop those protocols. And they did, but it's very difficult to get one person that has the ability to overpower another. And the whole idea was not to necessarily kill with it initially. The idea was to build just a sense of ill-being, to make someone hesitate in a decision process, uh, to make someone question their own motives for something. That was what the original intent behind it was. The people who really moved ahead in this category were the Soviets, and they did it with the uh, psychotronic generators that were developed, which are kind of the, or the original or the initial population control weapons that were being developed. And there were supposed to be 36, some of those, that belonged to the KGB, and when the Soviet Union came apart, all 36 of them disappeared into the woodwork, and nobody really knows where they are right now. But those were using directed energy to try to override the frequency of the human mind and cause pain, coma, lethar you know, to make you lethargic, to do things like that to you. Another question? Thanks. Touching on that. Can hear you. Thank you. Touching on that before I ask my question, because that is a very interesting, compelling question as to where they might be taking it now. Um, in some of my astral travels, I've observed where people are experimenting creating astral containers to use astral military weapons through thought. Then you know more than I do, because I don't know anything about that. I think that my, my great fear would be for you again. Now it goes into the issue of the reverence of truth versus the eagerness of truth. What do you really know by what you think you know? Right. And, uh, and if you're talking, you know, truth is the aristocracy of spirituality. And too often in this particular community, not just global sciences, but in others, we pursue the eagerness of truth. In other words, anything that comes, we chase after it. So it gets thrown, they, and they understand that the intelligence community knows that. And so what do they do? They make it a practice to, to design very juicy looking little bones for you and sling them out into your yard so you can go chase after those bones while again, they execute something over here behind you, okay? So you must pursue everything with the reverence of truth, which means step back and look at it Who's telling it to you? Mm -hmm. If it's derived by your own mind, then what is it? Is it AOL? Did you AOL this thing? Do you really know it, or do you just think you know it? Because that's the good, good question, I mean, to find that Directed answer. energy weapons and population control weapons are a reality. You know, we're moving in, we are in the unraveling phase. We have another 15, maybe 20 years, and we will move into a, what's called the destructive phase. Uh, the fourth turning of human societal evolution, global societal evolution. This is not my notion. This is the notion of what you might call the scholars of time. And if you want to read a book called uh, The Fourth Turning by Strauss and Howe, the limitation of the book is that it is focused principally on the global so or the uh, societal evolution of North America, but it is an excellent reference book to send you in different areas looking at the global societal evolution. Despite our cultural difference, we are evolving, cultural differences, we're evolving as a global society. We're moving into that fourth turning. When we move into that fourth turning, 
For the last 1,800 years, we have crossed the threshold of the fourth turning, and what do you think we've been confronted with? The destructive phase. What do you think we have been confronting in the destructive phase? Warfare on an ever-increasing scale of lethality and precision. In the century that we just left, crossing into this new millennium, 185,000 innocent men, women, and children died at the hands of war and war makers. Not soldiers, sailors, and airmen, but innocent men, women, and children. Great doctors who never were. Great philosophers, poets, and writers, and mothers, and fathers who never were. Great teachers who never were, who never will be, again, in this existence, okay? And they did that because we have created the greatest industry of death on the face of the planet, a $1.2 trillion a year industry of marketing death and destruction across the face of this planet. And our leadership knows, echelons above the President of the United States, echelons above the President you know, uh, uh, of Russia, and so forth and so on, they know that when we cross this next threshold, that they are going to have to have abilities to control very large, vast amounts of population and terrain. And that's where these new directed energy weapons are coming into play. Weapons that we cannot put into space right now because we can't miniaturize the power generation requirements. But we instead are putting them in major, large power generators on the ground, and we are firing this stuff up in the form of microwave or other types of directed energy weapons, and they are being moved around by reflector satellites. Just before the last time I spoke here, which was almost a year ago now, the Soviet Union had reflector satellites in space and was testing reflector satellites where they were beaming sunlight down into South Dakota and into Siberia. Every, any of you remember that? The test, the test failed, but that was their intent, was to beam sunlight down. And nobody said, why? You know, why are they beaming sunlight into South Dakota? Because they were testing the reflector satellites, the ability to beam directed energy weaponry and pass off around satellites to where they can then beam it down, adjust the footprint accordingly, and either take out the local gas station with a directed energy weapon. And I'm not talking about exploding it. I'm talking about mind control weaponry. I'm talking about projecting directed energy waves at a frequency that overrides the human brain and puts you to sleep or kills you, OK? Mm -hmm. Or agitates you, which was the next part of the answer to the question, which says, why are the millennial generation, why all these shootings, why all this agitated, why road rage, why all the other things that are happening in our global society that's turning us into such a vicious species, why? This may be another application of it. Okay? My time is up. I thank you. I knew we'd not get much accomplished in 55 minutes. But I thank you for your patience. And I'll be around for a while. And uh, you can ask me other questions. Okay? Thank you. Be true thank to yourself. Thank you very much, David. Uh, <laughs>